Welcome to The Joe Cohen Show. Join me as I share my experience with biohacking and invite top health experts to explore the latest technology, supplements, research, and resources for optimizing your body and brain. Okay, today I'm going to talk about lab testing. A lot of people have questions about what lab test should I do? People are very unclear about what they need to do for lab testing. And I think it's a very important topic. So I want to get to it. Where should they get the lab tests? There's a lot of questions around lab testing, what to do. And I would say there's a couple big mistakes when people take lab tests. Number one is people go to get a lab test from their doctor and they get, they say, oh, just give me everything. I want all the lab tests. And then their doctor gives them a bunch of lab tests, but it's actually quite basic. So they don't tell them what they need to do. So if you just go to your doctor and tell them very generally, I want a lot of lab tests or give me a general checkup, even if you tell them I want a comprehensive checkup, they're not going to give you a comprehensive checkup. They're going to give you very basic stuff. So that is unfortunately the way that the healthcare system works because insurance doesn't want to cover advanced tests or not even, I wouldn't even say that they're advanced. I would say they're just not going to cover anything that's not super basic. and. So you're going to have to pay out of pocket often. And then in these European countries or socialized healthcare systems, government-sponsored healthcare systems, there's a lot of cost controls. And so the doctors are really taught to only order what is and in the healthcare system in Israel. I have to fight to get more than a TSH. And it's very heavily dependent on the doctor. So many doctors will give you more. But then some doctors are just like, no, you don't need anything more than TSH for thyroid hormone function. And so when you're getting lab tests from doctors, it's very heavily dependent on on the doctor. If the doctor doesn't want to give you lab tests, my recommendation is go to another doctor. And and there's a lot of them that, that will fight with you on what lab tests to do. It's just there's so much information to know, uh, you know, and, and I have family members that are doctors and they just, they really don't know even as anywhere close to me uh, as uh, in these fields of what is the optimal range for each lab and how to manipulate it with lifestyle, diet, supplements. And so, yeah, if you don't really understand how to manipulate it, in the doctor's world, there's only drugs, really, right? And so if you can't manipulate something with a drug, then there's no reason to test for it. And there's really nothing to do about it, so they don't do it. The only thing that you could, one of the main things that you can manipulate with drugs is cholesterol. So that's why they test cholesterol, right? That's one of the main things they test. You can manipulate vitamin D by just giving vitamin D, but often they won't test for that as well. If you ask for it, they'll test for it. But in general, they're either trying to look for a serious disease, something that you're probably going to die in the next couple of years, or just to, something that shows that you're very sick, and then they could send you to a specialist, a specialist that for a specific condition, or they're looking for something that they can manipulate, which is usually something like cholesterol, and then the main treatment is statins. So that's the way the doctors look at blood tests, whereas the way that I look at blood tests is very different. I see each test that you can take as something to manipulate. They each have an optimal range. So the way that these ranges are conducted in lab tests is they take a population that is like reasonable. There's no diagnosed disease, right? But these people are not necessarily, they're they're not healthy. They just don't have a diagnosed disease. And then they say, okay, what's the 95th percentile of this population? And you see a, a broad range because there is a broad range. And the problem with that is that what is normal is not optimal, right? It's if you look on the street, People are overweight. They've got all kinds of different health problems. Most people are sick, right? Either they're not optimally healthy. Let's put it that way. And and what you're really checking is a population of people that are not optimally healthy. When I look at people's lab tests that are optimally healthy, and there's very few of those people, you see a different story with a lot of lab tests. Really, you really do see a different story. And most of these lab tests falling into a certain range, they're not wild all over the place. Like I'll give you an example with white blood tests, the range is, let's say, between 11, uh, 4 and 11. But if you're at 10, 11, 9, 8, something's wrong there, right? But no doctor is going to say anything because you're within the reference range. And you'll see healthy people really are, are not 
in that number. They're usually um, between five and seven, I would say. That, that's something to note. Now, let's go to what lab tests should you get? And I'll also talk about what lab tests I get and why I get each of these lab tests, the importance of each of them, knowing each lab test and, and the reason for getting them. So number one, I would recommend if you really don't know what is going on, on Self-Decode, we have a suggested labs recommendation. And what that does is it looks at all of your genetic predispositions and it tells you based on your genetic predispositions, these are some of the lab tests that you should check and it prioritize which lab tests you should check. Now, I think some of the core lab tests, the basic ones that doctors do are actually quite important. And this is a mistake that some people make in the functional health world is that they'll get all these super, super advanced tests that it's not always clear what it means, if it's how relevant it is. You really have to have a very deep understanding of these things before you really act on them. And they'll do those tests, but they won't do these basics. I had a client and I'm like, okay, show me your lab test. And he shows me all these super advanced lab tests that there's really not a lot of scientific studies on, right? And, and you really need to be very, have a very keen eye, go through it very carefully. There, there's some value in these tests, but you really have to be careful in how to interpret them. Uh, I don't do a lot of coaching, but I have a couple clients that they really want me to do it with them. So I, I do it. But essentially one client, I, based on certain things, certain symptoms or, or certain other labs, indirect labs, I said, you should check for a lupus marker just to see if there's something because he had something wrong. There was low platelets. And I said, why don't you go check for like lupus is just some autoimmune condition like lupus or could be a, a, a reason for low platelets. We still don't know exactly if he had lupus, but something that was interesting. So anyway, I was going through and I just haven't seen it. I was like, hey, look, you actually did this lupus test over here. He's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. It, well, it was an a, it's an ANA, &A. and and so I said, yeah, and actually you're high. It, it, it was an abnormal result. He's like, oh, that's interesting. And I looked at his suggested labs, and it turned out that high up on his suggested labs was to check for that ANA. So the system knew that it was something based on different risks, genetic risks he had, and I hadn't seen it for anyone else. So that was quite interesting. This is a, a pretty new feature, and just based on the use for the past couple of weeks, it's been quite interesting to see the lab recommendations that are coming up. And, and looking at my own, I noticed that, hey, yeah, that, that is important for me to check for. And so what I recommend, if you want to know what labs you should get checked for, go to self-decode. There's a suggested lab feature. And that's if you have your genetic, genetic testing done. And you can decide how many you want to take, what's within your budget, what you can get from your doctor. We do sell labs on the, the site as well, but you're welcome to buy them anywhere. And uh, yeah, and so there's different sites that sell them, but essentially you connect, we, we're connected with a, like a doctor that gives you a requisition, and then you could just go to Quest and get the test. If you're in the US, if you're abroad, you'll, we don't sell lab tests abroad at this time. In any case, so... It's going to give you all of the tests. It's just, it ranks them for you. You would start from the top, make sure that you've got all the, the tests from the top and keep working your way down until you get as many as your budget can afford. So that, that's a, a decision that you have to make. And everybody has a different insurance, a different doctor, lives in a different place and, and has a different budget. So each person, how many lab tests they can get is going to be different depending on the person. But my recommendation is the more you get, the better. The more lab tests I get, the more understanding I have in the body. And it goes perfectly with the genetics because you could see your genetic risks and you could see your lab risks, right? What's actually wrong in the body. And what's interesting is that if you have a genetic risk that, for example, but you don't have the lab, that could just mean that you're doing things right in that area. If your genetic risk is normal or typical and you have an abnormal lab for that, that means that something else is probably, meaning there's genetic predispositions only count for a certain amount of the variation for a lab, but there could be just something else that's wrong that's causing the lab 
to be really high. For example, I noticed a lot of people in India have very high levels of homocysteine. That is not going to show up on a genetic test. Pretty much everybody I've seen in India has very high levels of homocysteine. Now, exactly why that is, it's not genetics, right? So there's there, there, there could be genetic reasons for higher homocysteine, including MTHFR and certain other genetic variants. So we have a genetic report on that. There's obviously environmental variables that you could technically be typical or even lower on homocysteine genetically, but significantly higher in terms of your what you're doing in your lifestyle risk. I think a lot of that in terms of India probably has to do with vegetarian diet. So for some reason I see, I'm not, I haven't done enough research on it, but I think that it could explain for some of the reason. But there could be other reasons, oxidative stress and the greater methyl demand for whatever reasons. But in any case, so I would, no, step number one is go to self-decode, look at your suggested labs, okay? Do you want to hear about the one health hack that is sure to change your life? Okay, here it is. Subscribing to this podcast. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. So I have, I started doing lab tests. I never really did any lab tests before 2012. And in 2012, it hit me, hey, I need to see what the hell's going on in my body. And that's when I started doing lab testing and saving them. I may have done some before, but I never saved it. Didn't know what was going on. It wasn't digitized, so I don't have it. It was lost. I don't know where it was done, right? But I started meticulously saving them in 2012, being mindful to get them done and to save them. And now I have a very long-term history of the results. So the earlier you can get lab tests, the better. And the reason is because if something changes, I know you know, especially for the worst, and I know what my historical norm was. And so I've gotten the tests when I had a, had different kinds of diets, and I could see what changed over time as I changed diets, as I've done different things, as I've gotten older. And so that is quite useful to have a baseline. And so, so there's many ways that labs can be useful. The more you get, the better. Right, but there has to be a trade-off between convenience, affordability, and things like that. And so that every person has to make their own judgment. But the more you get, the better. And I wish that I had gotten more tests over the years. And that I, I never think that I get too many lab tests, personally. I think that the more I get, the, the more information I learn, the better, the smarter decisions that I make, and the healthier, the more optimal I get. And yeah, and so I I highly recommend that you get this very comprehensive testing and you get a baseline twice. And then my approach is, okay, now that we have this baseline, we know what the hell's going on. You basically make a treatment plan and then you say, okay, here's the markers that I want to optimize. And then you retest, right? You can retest just those markers. Again, there's a, an affordability equation here. Or you could test, retest all of them. I personally like to just test as much as I can, as many times as I can. Again, see how everything changes as I do an experiment. Because maybe one thing will get better, but something could get worse. But again, even if you just do, I, I don't want to dissuade people to think, oh, if I don't get as many tests as Joe, then it's not worth it. Even if you just get a regular CBC and a CMP by a doctor, these are the most basic tests that every doctor will give you even without asking, if you just said, give me a blood test, they're going to do a CBC and a CMP. No question about it. Even that is valuable, right? But again, the more you have, the better. So don't get dissuaded to not do a blood test just because if you think it's too overwhelming. Do whatever you can, whatever makes sense for your lifestyle, whatever makes sense for your affordability, what your doctor is going to give you, right? You, you have to be the decision maker there. But the bottom line is, is that the more tests you get, the better. And uh, these panels that they do at the doctor's office, they're very important, extremely important. And you can learn quite a, a bit from those. But again, there's a lot of things going on in the body and you really want to test as much as possible. I'm going to go through now 
the lab tests that I do, and I'll explain why I do these lab tests, what the importance are, right? Because people don't always necessarily understand why is it important to do these lab tests? What are you going to get from it? So the genetics is super important. And I, I see that as a base to really either tell you what lab tests to get or tell you the recommendations. It gives you things. It points out things that you wouldn't have seen, right? Where to look for, where to focus. And then the lab testing tells you where you're at the present moment, right? Because the genetics can't tell you what, your lifestyle is, what your supplements are. It can tell you a lot of information. And so I recommend getting the, the combination of those two is really extremely useful. And that's how I took my health to the next level, really. I've been looking at my genetics for a long time. As the software itself decode improves, my health has also improved by getting better recommendations, smarter recommendations. And then as well with the lab tests, that's also been a super game changer. And I would say that not only getting the lab test, so getting the lab test was one thing that helped, but uploading it to self decode was a game changer, right? Even if I know everything that I know now, the problem is that you have to see how things change and you have to be able to find things very quickly. So when I want to see, okay, how is my homocysteine at this date, at that date, at the, right? I have 15 different tests for homocysteine. There's no way I'm going to remember what my number was at every date, right? Even, even when I just go once and I do 300 tests, I'm not going to remember 300 different numbers, right? Oh, yeah, this is exactly that. You have, I have to check for it. Now, if I have to go and find the, the PDF and then do a search, and this, it takes too long. And then I don't see, I was like, oh, I wonder what it was in the past. I have to check in the past what it was. It just takes way too long. And you just have to upload it into a system. And the self-decode has that system. So there's one subscription and you get access to all this stuff. I really think that it's super important to have it all uploaded. And you also see the optimal ranges. I don't remember every optimal range for all 300 markers that, I've, that I do every time. I just don't. And also there's different conversions. So I can tell you it's 5 to 11, then that's in a certain unit. If you take a different unit, all of a sudden it's 8 to 13 or, you know what I'm saying? So it's very different based on, you, you have to have a system that converts it all into a centralized system unit, and then you could see the whole history. It tells you what the optimal range is, and then it tells you the recommendations of how to get them in the optimal range. So I'll look, off, I'll look that up also a lot of times. I don't remember, oh, every lab, this is exactly what you need to do. People ask me, hey, what do I do for this issue? What do I do for this lab? I don't have a photographic memory where I'm, I have a pretty good memory, actually, but even I would say probably in the 98th percentile of memory, but even my memory, I forget things, right? So just impossible. Even when I talk to people, like people are surprised. I know exactly what numbers and the ranges and this, that, and the other. So I have a pretty good memory for this stuff. But even me, who's like doing this a lot, great memory, I still don't remember a whole bunch of stuff of exactly what range and what I was, especially for the more obscure stuff. Very important to upload it to the system and then you'll get recommendations. And it, it takes the genetics and the labs and it combines them together to give you recommendations. Now, let me go through the labs that I take and why I take them. Okay, so first things first, a CMP. That is, it stands for complete meta, a comprehensive metabolic panel. And there's uh, six, There's usually about 16 labs in that. And the complete metabolic panel will check for your liver, your kidneys, and certain minerals, let's say potassium, sodium, chloride. But that's usually actually part of kidney function. But you can even just regularly, you can see it. There's value in seeing it regardless of kidney function. If you're low on sodium, you're low on potassium, you, you need more sodium and potassium, right? And so you could see, also you could see your bicarbonate, which is interesting. It tells you how acidic the blood is, and you want that to be in an optimal range. It tells you your total protein, and total protein is extremely important. You want to have enough protein in the body. And I would say in all of these markers that you see, there's a normal range and there's an optimal range. 
In addition, uh, so I'll just go through the rest of them. So there's uh, gallbladder and liver. Let's say mainly it's liver. And that is going to be the things that are going to be liver tests. There is the bilirubin, AST, ALT, ALP. Those are the, the main liver tests. And then you're going to have kidney tests. And that's going to be the creatinine. That's going to be the to some degree potassium, the blood urea nitrogen. Yeah, those, those are the main um, kidney tests. The albumin and globulin, that's going to be related more to liver, but that's also, it could tell you a lot of things. So albumin is actually a really good marker for overall health. You want your albumin to be on the higher end of the normal range that they have in the lab test. And that, that's a, a pretty good marker for optimal health. And then you're also, they're also going to check your fasting glucose which is going to tell you your blood sugar status. So that's the, also they tell you the calcium, your serum calcium, and that makes a difference. For example, if your calcium is higher, actually that can cause calcification, cardiovascular disease. It could also signify some kind of deficiency with vitamin D and some issues with the parathyroid hormone. So these things are supposed to be in a pretty tight range. And if they're out of the optimal range or out of the normal range, that means something's wrong. They could be out of the optimal range sometimes and nothing is necessarily wrong, but long-term you want to get them in the optimal range. Now, not every lab test that I do is in the optimal range. And actually, most recently I did a few of them. They're all in, the, they're, they're pretty much all in the normal range. And the ones that are not in the normal range like I'll, I'll give you an example here. So my fasting glucose is higher, but that's actually not bad if you check for your HbA1c. So my HbA1c is 5.2, which is actually quite healthy. It's in the optimal range. And I've also done a continuous glucose monitor so I could see my glucose all the time. And my glucose is very steady. Just for some reason, when I wake up, I take a blood test, my glucose goes up probably because of a, a cortisol spike, which is actually healthy. This is an example just doing, you looking at one test. If you just look at this and you look at somebody else's fasting glucose, you might think somebody else is healthier, but really it's the opposite. It has, there's not really any impact here. Just because I've done further testing and seen that this is actually quite fine given the fasting glucose, giving, g given a continuous glucose monitor, given my insulin, and given my HbA1c. So those three factors make me comfortable that the, this is fine, not something that you need to deal with. There is a warning sign here because in general, that could be indicator of a problem, but in my case, it's not. Interesting enough, my potassium was suboptimal. And so that makes me think that I need more potassium. My blood urea nitrogen has consistently come up high and this is one of the few things that, that are really suboptimal on a consistent basis that I need to bring down. Now, I've done much more thorough kidney testing, and it turns out that it's fine, right? Because there's another marker, cystatin C, which is an even better test for kidney function, and that comes out to be very healthy. So that's number one. And looking, I've done an ultrasound, I've done more advanced tests and there's nothing wrong with my kidneys function. Great. The reason why bun is higher, blood urea nitrogen, is because I eat more protein, number one, and I have more muscle. So if you have more muscle mass, you, you eat more protein, your blood urea nitrogen is going to be higher. There's no if, ands, or buts. However, I also think that it is still something I want to improve because there are some negatives to having higher levels, even if it's not indicative of a kidney problem. And so this is actually one of the things that I'm in the process. I've been in the process of, of trying to improve. I've done different things. And some through some further testing, I've been able to see that one of the reasons why I create more urea is because my arginine gets converted into ornithine too much. And that I figured out through an amino acid test. And during that process, you create more urea. Now, having higher urea, having higher ornithine is fine, even healthy, no problems there. But the question is, why do I convert it so much from arginine to urea? I have, there's tests that I'm doing right now, the experiments, and I'm going to retest to see 
if it changes anything, for example, I'm going to, I'm taking a larger dosage of AKG, alpha ketoglutarate, and that is supposed to reduce urea. We're going to see if that helps or not. So we need tests. And another thing was protein. So my total protein was in the normal range, but it was suboptimal. And I think I don't create enough chymotrypsin and that doesn't digest the proteins as well. And then I've also increased my protein intake. So it's the combination of those two. It could just be number one, that because I'm exercising more, my body really utilizes protein very much, my muscles. And so that's a good thing because I build muscles super quick, even without a lot of exercise. My muscles just suck up that, those amino acids and they get built really fast. But on the downside, I'm probably, I probably wasn't taking enough protein in and I probably wasn't digesting it completely also. For example, if I take in a lot of protein, uh, especially like protein shakes, I'll sometimes get gastrointestinal issues. So I started to take more digestive enzymes. And that should break down the protein, increase the absorption. So number one. And number two is I also started to increase my protein intake. So both of those factors, I think, should normalize that. Now, this is a, a good example of if you just test it once or even three times, for some reason, there, it was low. The, I tested it four times recently, and it was low all four times. Whereas when I tested it in the past, it usually was not low. There is something more recent that I think that I'm just, it's because I'm exercising more and I'm not increasing my protein enough. I'm trying to get in enough fiber. I also don't want to get bloated. I'm also trying to not eat too much in general. So it's balancing those. But what's clear is that I'm not taking in enough protein and I'm not probably not digesting as well. So the, the bottom line is the takeaway is that I've started taking digestive enzymes and I started to increase my protein intake. And I found actually better muscle gains by doing that, more energy, better overall function. Now what we need to do is check my lab test to make sure that my levels are in a good range and to make sure that what I'm doing is working. So that is one of the basic tests that you need to do, right? And that comes up high up and that makes sense because it's a quite important test. And then for each test, you could see w what kind of risks you can basically get from that. So for example, let's say low mood. So if we look at this, it says, a CMP helps screen for electrolyte imbalances, which may cause mental manifestations that resemble depressive symptoms. So for example, if you have low potassium, low sodium, that could cause mood changes. And, and so it's important to check your CMP for that. Next up is vitamin B12. So often this is tested, often not. And vitamin B12 has a lot of benefits that you want to make sure this has. This is in the optimal range. And so, for example, this is important for mood. And people with lower levels of vitamin B12 have a higher risk for depression. And vitamin B12 intake and supplementation could reduce the risk of depression. It's also important to prevent hair graying. And we give the optimal ranges here. So you could see my B12, I like it on the higher end. And the reason is because if, I, if my body's fighting an infection, it sucks up a lot of B12. I also find it's good for mood. And so I, the, the optimal range we have is 400 to 1,000. But I tend to like mine closer to 1,000. Low levels of B12 are, are associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. And something like Alzheimer's and dementia happens over a long period of time. So you want to get these things in an optimal range. Sooner the better. Next up is the thyroid panel. The thyroid panel is extremely important because that really has a lot of functions in the body. It really for a whole bunch of different things. So cognition. If you have low thyroid hormones, that could speed up hair graying, for example, or high thyroid hormones as well. It could cause hair loss, cognitive decline. It can cause low energy, cardiovascular issues, anxiety, bone problems, and general circulation. You might feel cold. It's important for metabolism and just cognitive function in general. So there's a lot of reasons why you would check 
your thyroid hormones. And again, what your doctor is going to tell you is optimal is not optimal. I like my T3 in the higher range, free T3 as well. There are clear studies showing that the higher the free T3, the better, pretty much. And free T3 is a pretty good indicator of general health status because a lot of things that increase oxidative stress will bring it down. And you could see my, so I like free T3 above three. The optimal range we have is above three, up to 4.7. It's not a problem unless you have Graves' disease or something like that and your thyroid hormones are overactive. But you could see that something like this has changed over time. So testing early on, I was on the lower end, 2.6 around, and then over time I went to 3.5, and then I got lower, and the reason that was is because I was taking certain supplements that inhibited thyroid function, and once I saw that my tests were lower consistently, I got rid of those things and I was able to increase it. So now it's above three usually, which is in the optimal range. So when you're getting a thyroid panel, I highly recommend that you get total T3, total T4, free T3, free T4, and TSH. Often doctors will only test TSH, and that is a problem. This is a, a big misconception here is with doctors even. They think that with the, the TSH, you can really, you know, tell everything that you need to know, which is completely not true. So you could see that my TSH varies wildly while my certain, it, it almost, it seems like it wouldn't correlate with the other thyroid hormone levels at all, literally, which is very confusing. If I didn't know that they were all part of the same system, I would think that they're just, they're completely different lab tests. The optimal range we have is 1.5 to 2.5 for TSH. But if you're a little higher, that's fine as long as the other, all the other labs are normal. The reason why people are normally concerned about a higher TSH is because that usually indicates lower thyroid hormones, right? In my case, that's not the case, right? It, again, I'm doing things different. I don't have a typical, I'm not a typical person, but you could see that my TSH is higher and my T, free T3 is very good. So normally you would think that certain results might be lower. My T3, total T3 is good. My total T4 is good. My free T3 is good. And my total free 4 are good. Not only are they good, they're higher than most people. So it doesn't really correlate that much for me. And actually there's studies showing that having higher levels of TSH have many benefits absent any kind of thyroid condition. So this is where it gets tricky. If you have higher TSH, that's an indicator that something could be wrong with the thyroid or there's some issues that you need to address. But there's a caveat that if your TSH is higher and everything else is great, that's actually a benefit. And not higher in the sense of 10, but something in the realm of two and a half to three is, is still fine. So we have it as suboptimal just because we're, we're trying to flag people that, hey, there might be something wrong if you're doing this test. But I'm just saying here that you want to look at that more thoroughly. For example, somebody comes to me and say, hey, I, they, maybe they have hair loss or they're graying their hair. Hair loss could be from a, a bunch of reasons, right? It could be thyroid hormones. It could be iron deficiency. It could be not having enough protein. How am I supposed to know what the hell is going on if I don't see the lab test? Now, people tell me I eat enough meat and everything's great. And then I look at their lab test. And I'm like, your iron is low. <laughs> and they're like, and, and myself, it's, hey, I'm eating tons of protein and my total protein is still low or it's suboptimal. It's not like low on, on the normal range, but it's still suboptimal. And so it almost doesn't matter what you say. Oh, I eat a lot of meat or I'm eating enough iron or I'm doing this. You need to look at the lab results. And so I've seen a lot of times people come to me with, they just tell me, oh, I'm Losing, I have hair shedding or I'm losing my hair. Now, again, if you're a guy, then that could be male pattern baldness. It could be related to DHT, testosterone, and other factors. If you're a woman, it could be an autoimmune condition. But if you don't have that auto, alopecia areata, if you don't have that autoimmune condition, then it's usually some kind of nutrient that you're missing. It could be some of the B vitamins maybe, right? But the most common, I'd say, have to do with Thyroid hormones, iron, protein, and then some kind of nutrient deficiency that is important for the hair. It could be one of the B vitamins, maybe biotin, maybe something else. But 
you can't know until you check all of those markers. Now, if you want to be cheaper about it, more affordable, I shall say, you can do more basic tests before you go through the more comprehensive ones. But actually, in this case, the iron, protein, and uh, thyroid panel are all pretty basic. So nothing to worry about there. Complete blood count, super important. You could see also this has impacts for hair loss. It can help identify certain nutritional deficiencies or autoimmune conditions, but you'd have to do further tests if you're doing that. One of the things, so number one is if your white blood cells are out of whack, like really out of whack, they might do further testing for autoimmune issues. You're also able to test your hemoglobin. Hemoglobin could be an indicator of iron deficiency if it's low. Usually, if you have low hemoglobin, that's usually because of iron deficiency. And that's really what the complete metabolic panel, that's how it would relate to hair. You can do further tests. I recommend doing iron and ferritin, so serum iron and ferritin. And through those markers, you could get a decent idea. With serum iron, ferritin, and hemoglobin, you get a pretty good idea of what, what is whether you're iron deficient or not. But you could see that there could be a lot of different issues from a complete blood count. And you want to make sure they're in the optimal range because they could really affect a whole bunch of things in the body. And again, people sometimes, not they almost always overlook this stuff, right? They just, they go to more advanced testing. I would recommend really starting from the basics and keep doing more advanced testing. So super important, really the, the complete blood count is looking at your immune system. You don't want it to be too active, too underactive. And you're looking at your white blood cells, your lymphocytes. So in my case, interesting enough, my monocytes, mine tend to be on the lower end. So the, the normal range is 0.2 to 0.8. And the mine tend to be around 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And this time it was 0.14. That isn't a problem if your immune system is working well. And mine is working well now. There's no issue really. And having low monocytes are a benefit in the sense that when you have higher monocytes, they can stick to blood vessels and that can cause atherosclerosis, especially if you also have inflammation. So there is some benefit, but again, it's flagged just in case that there's something else, something is not right. You, you should look into it. DHA, DHEA sulfate. This is an interesting one. This is, I don't think this is normally checked for, but I think it's actually quite an important test to check for. And you could see my history. So in this case, having a history is very important. I first checked it in 2015, April 2015, and I had a 275. And it wavers, right? It's gone down, it's gone up. My genetic predisposition is that I have lower levels of this. And you could see it, it tends to be on the lower end, right? It's on the lower end, even when I'm supplementing with DHEA. And I didn't really understand fully why that is until recently. So DHEA converts into, into testosterone. And studies show that if you have higher levels, that has benefits on mortality. It's also an androgen. It's good for mood. So you could see like DHEA sulfite. What does it have to do with? It has to do with muscle mass. So genetically higher levels causally associated with reduced inflammation and improved muscle mass, okay? Because it is an androgen. It's related to heart health. Now, low DHEAS may be associated with a higher risk of heart disease and mortality, especially in men, right? So again, every marker that you have is because of some reason. And you have to understand what that reason is. And you don't want to be uh, have a higher risk of, of anything here, right? So genetically higher levels uh, can also be associated with a decreased risk for Alzheimer's in men, right? Uh, genetically, these genetic studies show that it's causal, but you can see here that my, low, my levels are lower, which is why this test comes up higher. So it's also important for mood. Low serum and plasma DHEA, DHEA levels are associated with depression in some people. And so if somebody says, hey, I've got a bad mood, right? Or they're anxious or they have different kinds of issues, how do I know if that has to do with their DHEA, if it has to do with their thyroid hormones, if that has to do with their iron levels, not enough protein, right? It could be related to a whole bunch of stuff. 
how do I know what the hell is going on if I don't see the lab tests? Or how do you know? You can't. That's why getting these lab tests are critical. So an amino acid panel can help people with low mood because certain amino acids like tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine are pre precursors to serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. It turns out my DHEA, I think it was low because I didn't have enough sulfur. So if you actually look at DHEA itself, most of the body, most of the DHEA in the body is stored as the sulfate. But you could see my DHEA levels are normal, but the DHEA sulfate is low. It turns out that I think that has to do with just not having enough sulfur in the body. And I'm pretty confident that now that I'm supplementing with MSM, my DHEA is going to go up. And if that turns out to be true, then that's very good information to know for anyone who has low DHEA. Is that due to just lower androgen production or is it due to not enough sulfur? And so you could see that my latest result, four out of my latest results had to had low DHEA levels. And I think that has to do with low sulfur. So let's see if that actually pans out in the blood. But I think it has to do with that. And the reason why it's lower now is because, and, and why it started to get lower here is because as I started exercising more, I placed more of a demand on sulfur in the body and it, it wasn't creating enough. It was being shunted into other purposes. So, you know, DHEA sulfate comes up pretty high for me and it won't come up that high for many people. The reason why it comes up high is because it's quite important for me. And that's based on my blood test. So again, if you're on some kind of budget, you might not check for DHEA normally, but because it comes up high. And so the system is pretty smart. It also tells me to check for blood urea and nitrogen. You could see here, if you're looking at the screen, it tells me all these things that it's telling me to check actually had some things that are, are suboptimal. So it, it's pretty smart in telling me what to check, including creatine kinase. I don't know how it knew to check creatine kinase, but my creatine kinase tends to be high. And this is something that I'm still working on improving. So you could see here, every time I've checked creatine kinase, <laughs> it come, came up as high. Now, again, if, you're, if you have a lot of muscles, so that is going to come up higher. I still think that there could be something that I could bring it down. I wonder if the MSM is going to bring this down. And if it does, then I will report back on that. But normally, creatine kinase is not something I would recommend for regular people to check for. But because it comes up here, it, I, don't, I don't know exactly how it knew it. But again, you could look. There's an algorithm here. But yeah, it's telling you what you need to check for. And the, the algorithm does change based on different inputs, based on we're adding symptoms and conditions, lifestyle risks. So it's going to be, it's already pretty damn smart, but it's going to get a lot smarter. In any case, hopefully, if you don't have self-decode, hopefully you could still get insights into the things that I'm telling you to check for. The liver functional panel, I think, is very important. Again, that's part of a CMP. The only thing that would be in addition to that would be lactate dehydrogenase or LDH and GGT. So those are a little more advanced, but I would highly recommend doing those tests because the GGT is more sensitive, meaning the lower the GGT, generally the better. Whereas most people are not going to have abnormal AST or ALT or any of the other of these liver markers. The GGT is going to be more sensitive. So most people are going to have elevated GGT actually. And so if you're if you really want to know, okay, is my liver really functioning fine? You, you want to check your GGT. And you, you generally want to get it to around 15 or under. And you could see that it fluctuates a little bit. It's, it says it's out of the optimal range here, but it's just barely 15.9. So 15.2, 15.9. And I got it down from 18. It was here 26. This is actually when I was fighting an infection. So that kind of makes a little sense. I wouldn't. I would take that with a big grain of salt. But I'd say that at one point it was 21.3. So I was able to get it down quite significantly. And by the way, this is not random that it's going down. There's no blood test that's random, right? There's It could be random in the sense that if you're fighting an infection, there's going to be some different results. But everything that goes 
in the body is not random. There's means that if you're in one level or another, it means something is happening. And you want to be in the optimal range for every lab test, not necessarily all in one shot. Ideally, that would be the case, but you want to overall be optimal. And for GGT, we have more strict criteria, but under 15 means that your liver is functioning pretty fine. And for me, I took Tutka. I found that was the only thing that really did a, a good job for me. And again, we have all the recommendations. There's a lot of recommendations to how to get all these lab markers in the optimal range. Phosphorus, I think, is very important. It's often elevated in people, especially with a higher protein diet. And so that's something you want to check for. Often not part of the standard check. Zinc is useful. So it shows me I have a genetic predisposition for lower zinc. Testosterone is useful. Highly recommend doing total testosterone, free testosterone, and DHTA. DHT could be useful as well. HSCRP, I think, is critical. So a lot of times they won't check for it, but it's that basically is the best indicator, single indicator for inflammation in the body. Lipid panel is, is usually going to be part of the CMP. If not, it should also be included. Lipids are quite useful. So these are things that usually the doctors will give you. Sometimes not, but usually they'll give you. And I would say that these are the basic stuff. You can get a lot of information, but it's still often far from the total picture. But it's the basic stuff. You should try to get them at least once a year. I prefer every quarter, but if you want to do it every half a year, every year, as often as you can get them, the better. Okay. Next time, I'm going to go through more detailed lab testing. So I'm going to go through my all of my results that are a little more advanced, different kinds of tests that are a little more advanced. This one, I went through the basics and how to know what lab tests you should get. Kind of, this is an intro, you could say, to what lab test should you get? Because I get this question all the time. Hey, Joe, give me what lab test should I get? And like I said, I, I gave you a, a list of lab tests that you should get here. There's a couple lab tests that maybe you, you don't need so much. And there's some lab tests that I didn't mention that might come up high if you look at your suggested labs and self-decode. So those are things to really think about. Okay, that's all for now. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show. So please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey all while helping to keep us ad-free. 